there, I'm Barbara Turley and you're watching another episode of Feminine Wealth TV, the show that uncovers the diamond tips on creating truly conscious wealth from change makers, world shakers and wealth creators. So far on the show, I have had all three of those types of women, amazing women out there doing amazing things. And today I'm continuing my Balinese trip with my uh, interviewing women over here. And I have a total change maker with me today. Please welcome Margaret Barry to the show. Hi everybody. So Margaret is the CEO and founder of the Bali Children's Foundation, which is absolutely an amazing philanthropic effort that's happening here in Bali around the education of children. So Margaret, to kick off, tell us a little bit about the foundation and what the work that you're doing here in Bali. Okay, Bali Children Foundation, our, our, our mission is to educate disadvantaged children um, in Bali and to educate them. And by disadvantage, in our case, we're looking at re poor and remote is our main category of disadvantage. Yeah. So um, on that basis, we work in North Bali and in West Bali, where there are really big pockets of poverty, particularly in the hills, which are dry mm -hmm. as well as poor soil. And, and there wouldn't be as much tourism up there, of course. That's correct. Yeah, there's right. very, uh, particularly in the West, there's virtually no tourism in the area we're mm -hmm. in. In the North, it is developing, which is helping our sustainability programs. But So the aim is to get children in these, in these dry um, poor hills educated yeah. and to that end we've got to the point where we've developed a scholarships for over 1,000 students. I mean currently we have 1,000 students at school wow. or at university on our scholarships yeah. and we're working, we work in children's homes mm. but our primary work is in communities yeah. so we're working directly in two children's homes mm. We support another three with projects as and when they need assistance. Yeah. And we're working in over 30 communities throughout North and West Bali. That's fabulous. And I mean, the foundation has been in operation now for, what, 15 years? Yes. Yeah. 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 14 years. Yeah. And I know, I mean, obviously, you're also a female entrepreneur. So we also yes. have female businesses yes, on the in show. Yes, I'm fashion business. Yes. So you're in the fashion business. So tell me a little bit about, um, so your entrepreneurial journey or business ownership journey, you weren't always a business owner. So tell me how you started out in, in the fashion industry and where it all started. Okay. Well, um, I started in fashion in the mid-70s, yeah. and very soon I was in India working for a company, which at that point was quite small, yeah. but later became very large. And as that company grew, I had the incredible opportunity to grow with them and always be in a very senior role in that company. Mm -hmm. That company was called Malika. And we went from being a little company of a couple of hundred thousand turnover to by um, the end of the 80s, we were turning over 10 million. And that was very significant. In the 80s in India, that was massive. Yeah, and yeah. I was the senior executive in the company. Yeah. Uh, my boss and I ran the company and, you know, we, we topped and tailed between Australia and India. Mm. But I was pretty good at Asia. Yeah. And um, I was running the design and marketing side of the company, so developing collections and also overviewing production. Um, so I ended up spending most of my time in India mm. um, during that period based in New Delhi. Yeah. So I was employed by that company. Um, it was an extraordinary growth process. So I had the opportunity to learn the industry very well, both from the design, which I had no background in originally, yeah. and I started off with designers working for me. Mm. And as time went on, I became a little more hands-on in that regard. And, uh, but it was also a very important management role because we were talking, obviously, big numbers, going mm. to department stores, etc. So there was a lot of logistics work involved. And just plain program management because of these are the days before yeah. um, internet or... I know. It I mean, so we were working then. with yeah. a telex machine that had a punch tape that ran through it. So mm. if someone fell over, the, if you had a long message, the, the, the tape could be, you know, 20 metres long. And if <laughs> someone fell over time. the tape, it was like, oh, my God. And <laughs> yeah. we've got to try and put it back together. And you've lost a whole paragraph of your message while you right. fix it. And we were working with a five-hour time difference. I mean, yeah. 
and we were working with incredibly dodgy electricity. I mean, it was it makes us realise how easy it is to miracle do actually. that anything ever happened, let alone this extraordinary company developed. Yeah. And it developed because there was a team of extraordinary people. And then did you? So then you went. You moved to Bali after that. Was yes, that Bali. I decided to start my own business because yeah. I was starting. I was in my late thirties. India was very dangerous. It was a time of real terror, mm. and we were we were working at a phenomenal rate. And I figured that if I didn't get out and do my own thing. Mm. I was going to spoil my energy, and I'd have not, you know, I'd be, I'd be a burnt out wreck, and wouldn't be yeah. able to do anything at all. So, you know what's funny about that, actually? I mean, although you were working in India at the time, I know there's a lot of women out there feeling that way who are in the corporate world right mm. now. And you know, we get into our mid thirties and we start to think, oh my god, is this all there is? I'm just going to end up this bitter, exhausted, overwhelmed woman. Mm. You know, you sort of lose. And I was talking to Zoe Watson, who has the Bliss Sanctuary here, yes. about this problem recently. Yes. And she was saying the same thing. We end up sort of losing our feminine side a bit. Or we end up losing our feminine energy to this sort of overwhelm and burnout. So, so, so this is what brought you to Bali. Why, why did you choose Bali? Um, okay, I took the pragmatic. Yeah. Our market was Australia. I knew the Australian market. Yeah. I couldn't do India because the company I was working with was so huge. They would have smashed me if I'd mm. even had an attempt, even looked sideways at their market. Yeah. And they were huge co quota holders. So I needed that friendship. I needed ah, their yeah, okay. quota. So yeah. there was no question. There just wasn't an option to do India. So I needed to take my expertise somewhere where it would be of some value. Yeah. So Asia, I knew how to do Asia. I'd done 15 years already. Yeah. I'd opened up other markets as well. I'd opened up production in China, Hong mm. Kong, um, and been involved in other um, you know, investigations. So I sort of figured out, that you know, they used to say, yeah. there was a saying in the company, if you want to do something, you, just set, you send Mark to the town and in three days she's got something started for you and that's oh, right. that was your selling thing. in London and that was kind of my thing I could do it quite well yeah. so I thought okay Bali's great it's only five hours from Melbourne which is mm-hmm. where I was going to be based it's relatively inexpensive and very quick mm-hmm. only a couple of hours time zone difference yeah plenty of motorbikes as we can hear plenty of motorbikes <laughs> but yeah. a pleasant place and yeah you know why not have have a place that's a bit more ambient for a change because India was Many things, but it yeah. wasn't ambient at all. Yeah. So I came here under the ap- under the misapprehension that it was a reasonably benign business environment oh, right, because okay. India was a quite tough and heavily regulated business mm. environment, and I thought that this one was going to be less so. In fact, not true. Was it? Yeah, because I'm interested to know. It was think. incredibly difficult. Yeah, and I think um, a lot of women would have this perception as well. I, I know there's women out there thinking, "I'd love to just move to Bali and start a business," you know, or move to in Thailand and start a business. But it's not that simple. Well, these days it's much easier mm. because these days the regulation process is quite clear. And if you want to come and open a business, you can, as yeah. long as you're prepared to go through the processes. But those days we still had. Uh, Suharto in power. He was the right. um, dictator president at the time. And any as soon as you got into anything that was vaguely lucrative, suddenly there would be all these obstacles put in front of you. And if you interview any of the Westerners who've been here, yeah. you know, 20 plus years, you'll hear this repeated as a story. Yeah. Some of them had much more challenging run-ins than I, but you just couldn't make a buck. No oh, matter what so you did. You just yeah. could never quite get there. And then in 98, we had a f- big financial crisis that went throughout yes, Southeast right, yeah. Asia and resulted in a complete change of power in this government, mm. uh, in the Indonesian government. And at that point was the beginning of a democracy and the beginning of some opportunity for, for mm-hmm. small and medium businesses. And how did you get through those early years? I mean, what made you stay? So you came, there was this, well, uh, you couldn't make absolute a Well, absolute dogged persistence. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'd Resilient. got used to living in Asia, and I really didn't want to live back all that much in the West. I preferred living in Asia, so I was yeah. happy to be here physically. Mm. Um, I certainly considered going back and getting in paid work. Yeah. That, that was something that had to be considered on a number of occasions. I had very good support from my family. Mm. They helped me through more st- stages than they probably like to think about. But they <laughs> yeah, yeah, they were there. Um, they were there for me. And 
I had a very good supporter here, a guy mm. called Agul Sutama, who's a local lawyer. Yeah. I'd met him like the first week I came to Bali. Mm. And when I think of all the absolute idiots that I could have met, including some lucky. of those who've been recently interviewed on yeah. what really happens in Bali, um, I was very lucky. You know, he's a guy who's always had my back and been very good and to me. And he was a lawyer. He was a lawyer. He was a law student at that stage. Right, He'd okay. gone back to finish his degree. He's now a lawyer. Because I think and what's he's the, yeah. ch- he's the chairman of the Bali Children Foundation in Indonesia. Ah, okay. okay so. Because what's really fascinating about that, and what I love about that particular part of your story, is that a lot of what I coach women business owners into thinking about is that you need to have. I call it your dream team. But you need to have certain a few people on your support team. Yeah. You need a really good accountant, and you know, a lot. If you're somewhere like Bali, I think a really good lawyer or a legal person is very, yeah. very important. So in you Bali, need, the legal side is, is more important than the accounting yeah, side. Yeah. The accounting side is certainly very important once you're going. Yeah. And a real challenge here, mm. one that I'm still dealing with on a daily basis. Oh really? That's so any amazing accountant that doesn't want to move to Bali. A new saviour. Yeah, it's called Zero software. I know. I'm using Zero. Please, anyone out there, use Zero. It is fantastic. Yeah. I'm not being paid for this. It's Zero great is fantastic. Zero dot com. Yeah, yeah, brilliant so, software. And the great thing about Zero is that they've got a marvelous, a marvelous support team. Yeah, they're twenty four yeah. hour support team. Yeah, and. You know, tr- um, we're actually setting up Bali Children Foundation on zero at the moment. Yes, brilliant. And, you know, it's really hard because the staff always, in any situation when they've been using one system, uh-huh, they yeah. will come up with so many objections as to why it yeah. won't work. Well, you can imagine in Bali, where we've got multiple currency, we've got half trained staff, we've got everything else going yeah. on. The objections are Endless. humongous, mm. but the Zero team have been able to work through those objections, yeah. and we're getting it. It's going really well now. Yeah. And as soon as we've finished and we've caught up with, so that we've got we've got it on another system which is similar to Mile, but it's a local system. Yeah. So we're running them, of course, in tandem for this year. But as soon as I've got it them balanced and working together absolutely mm. in tandem I'm putting my business on to zero too yeah. it's great and just so and you mentioned your team there because another yeah. thing I'm really a big fan of I mean obviously in a business like yours which is the retail business you yeah. need to have teams of staff and people yes but obviously you're pretty good at I think a really important part of business is learning to lead your team and inspiring them to sort of take control of things well one thing you have so to learn you can get here on with, you know is you've got to learn to mine your opportunities because yeah. The situation. Do you think that's anywhere, though? Probably. I mean, in some respects, you have to hunt your opportunities You've out. You've got to mine your opportunities, yeah. and I mean, and this does. This applies to Mag, in on, on one hand. Yeah. But it particularly applies to Bali Children Foundation. Yeah. Because now, when I look back, I mean, we haven't built one thousand scholarships, and the you know the mm. big education programs we're doing in the communities for English and computer studies and, and you know, yeah. teaching the kids how to go out and get themselves jobs. That's called Work Ready. That's another whole That's part of our program. Good, yeah. And it works really well. Yes. Um, just a little bit of a skite. We've just had 69 kids graduate year 12. And when I say just, I mean literally three weeks ago. Yeah. And 60 of them are already employed or accepted at uni. So we've got nine to go. I mean, that's in three weeks. That must just light your heart up. Is that what lights your soul up? Well, it makes it much easier to get support from the communities because they can see the kids going out and being employed and bringing in real money where these families live on. Like our average family lives on 30 to $50 a month. Wow. And one of their children Mm. going out as a graduate... This is a high school graduate, not yeah. uni graduate. One of the kids going out as a graduate is going to bring in between eighty and hundred and twenty dollars a month. So right. the Which change, is still so nothing, but for them it's four times. The change better. to that family income is just humongous, mm. and um, it totally changes the life yeah. of that family. So yeah. as long as we can get the kids jobs, mm. the families will, because we help. You know, we're helping with. Um, school fairs and uniforms and books mm. and special training and all of that. But the parents have still got to feed the kids. Yeah. And these children traditionally dropped out of school at grade six. Mm. In these communities, in our communities, we look at 35 to 65% dropout at grade six primary school as the norm. 
So really they have no benefit from going to school at all then, because really the six years... Well, they, what is they're, it? they're literate, yeah, but and they it. can speak Indonesian, because yeah. remember their uh, primary language is Balinese, oh, so, totally so they have to learn to speak Indonesian to get into the main workforce anyway, so they've got those advantages. But, you know, with our program, they right. can go on and do very well. The trouble is that the parents have got to keep them at school another six years. Mm. When you're on 30 to $50 a month and you're feeding your whole family, yeah. even if it's only a family of four, and plenty of them are more than that, mm. it's a huge thing to ask. So we need to be able to prove that, that we can deliver. And yeah. fortunately, our, our performance does prove that. So mm. Mm. we now have absolutely no difficulty um, our pledge originally was my pledge to my board was originally that it, within three years I promised we would have no dropout at grade six. Yeah. Well, in fact, we have found that it's in one year we can get it to zero. Yeah. Basically, as soon as we appear in the community, everything changes. Mm. And in many cases, because they've been waiting for us to come. So is there, there's way more communities that you could that you could help oh, yeah, even yeah, now, today? Because, yeah. I mean, the foundation's been running 14 years now. Yes, but we're really just starting to hit yeah. our straps volume-wise. Yeah. We're at 1,000 now. Um, I hope we'll be at, at 2,000 in another couple of years. Mm. Mm, our estimation, and the stats are really rubbery, even though we can get official stats, they're still a bit rubbery, but my estimation is it's somewhere between probably around another 15,000. Mm. There's somewhere between twelve and 15,000 that are of children who are out there in the north and the west alone who would qualify for our program. Wow. Which means that they're economically deprived, they're in a remote 15, situation. 15,000 just 15 yeah. times the what you've got already. Yeah. And, of course, obviously this, you know, I, I'm very interested in the money yeah. side. So, you know, I'm a firm believer, and the reason I really wanted to get you on the show is I mm. love when I see somebody who's channel, channeling money in the right way. Yes. And, you know, you're, you're harnessing money from lots of different areas. So yes. you've got some corporates, you've got and some women Corporate who come to, to Bali. Uh, biz- local businesses in Bali. Local businesses yeah. are channeling money into this as well. And philanthropic assistance from Australia. Yeah. Significant philanthropic support from Australia. Yeah. Are those from uh, those philanthropic uh, um, trusts or whatever, are those funded by businesses or family money or combinations? Do you know? Mm, a combination. Yeah. Mostly to, to do with business. Yeah. Um, but there is some situation of family trust as well. Yeah, which would have yeah. come from business or something. Yeah, yeah, it's come from some situation. So it's this concept well. of, as but business this, owners, we yes. can really harness what we're doing in business, and if we're making money, then there are areas where we can we can really channel that money into just creating the next generation of growth for we our world. We can, yeah. or even, it's not even so much our own money. It's because most women are not... Opera Winfrey. Most women are not yeah, wealthy yeah. entrepreneurs who've been very successful yeah. and are able to fund their own foundations. Mm-hmm. Most women who have got foundations, and I mean, this foundation came out of lessons from the Bali bomb, yeah. as did many others in Bali. Mm-hmm. We are not unusual. In fact, almost every foundation in Bali has been developed by a member or someone who probably almost all of them my friends who mm-hmm. were active in the process after the bomb. After the Bali bomb. So yeah. it was an experience. It, just was a, it was an awakening of something. Well, it was an experience where, I, in my case, mm. I saw the combination of working with the Balinese community, mm. working with the expat community and working with tourists yeah. who have considerable expertise enabled us to get a, a very positive outcome out of what was an appalling tragedy. Mm. And it was that formula that I've, I've used Yes. And towards education in Bali, and that's that's how we work, and that's yeah. how we've been effective. So, like the members of my board have all come from; they're all visitors. They're all tourists to Bali, right? Okay. Yeah. And now they may have met me in other ways, like their accountant recommended me yeah, back okay. to accountants, yeah. or one of the doctors that I worked with during the bomb knew of my work and recommended me. So it, it came through a lot of sources, but mm. all of them are tourists who come to Bali. Mm. Many of them have properties in Bali. And they'd like to give back a bit more to And yeah. they're interested in giving back. 
And, yeah. But the fact that they've got a relationship in the society, they know a bit about what's going on here. Mm. Um, they're able to know what I do and trust it, mm. and that enables them to be big supporters. Yeah, yeah. But it's not all that. I mean, it's it's people that I've been in, known through business for years. Mm. Um, like in the Malika days, it was the days of ethnic clothing. Mm. So there were lots of ethnic clothing businesses around then. Yeah. Now, my mates from that period, who were technically our competitors, but they were our friends, mm. virtually all of them are supporting me either yeah. through individual scholarships for tertiary education yeah. or through corporate scholarships where they might be doing one or two villages. So, I mean, significant, significant support. Yeah, yeah. So when I talk about mining your, res- your friends or mining your resources, mining your opportunities, it's not just about your own money. I yeah. think in certainly in the Bali situation where we're not well off, um, the... Your money, your, your own business enables you to give you staff and, and yeah. bri- bricks and mortar and all of those things to get going. So it's um, mm. uh, that you get a pro bono situation mm. developing that enables you to do what you do. Yeah. Because I'm in the rag trade, I've got a lot of staff. Yeah. So when I need a big job done, like we distribute goods to the communities every six months. Yeah. People bring their donations here to the BCF office. We save them up. We've got a big store next door. Mm-hmm. And then every six months we get the mag staff in and we lay them out all over the floor in that big front area. Yeah. And we break them up into 30 communities so that everyone gets a fair share. Yeah. So, so your my, staff from your my business? My staff from my business come, come and in. do that because yeah. it's a big job. But that's a resource too. When I say yeah. money, I suppose I mean your resource. Yeah, resources. that's what I'm saying. Yeah, is yeah, that that in, you have more than in money. In Bali, and, and I think many women have more than money. Money mm. is something that it's great if we've got, mm. but the other stuff we've got as a business is actually more important. Reputation, mm. yeah. where, you, where your business is based, yeah. your staff who can help you. And, it, I mean, it's a great way of including... Uh, including your staff in this sort of work usually provides them with great satisfaction. And fulfillment. Yeah, yeah they, they the really enjoy it. So yeah. it gives them a life beyond just their yeah. work life. Well, I guess you. it means that then you're harnessing the resources, all the resources that you have. So you have your business, it has resources in there. Mm. And then there's money and then your time and passion. And, and, and then all there's these the tourists. Things. The and tourists there's your family. In. And there's yeah. people you've done business with. Yeah. And there's your contact list yeah. on Google. You oh, think yeah. about it. All and the then there's you know. everyone you know is on Facebook. Yeah, yeah. So there's these enormous and particularly communities with modern situations, yeah. all those communities. A question I'd love to know uh, to ask you, if there is someone out there who does have the resources to create a foundation, let's say there's a woman out there who's running a decent sized business and could create a foundation, or maybe there's a few women together mm. that could create. How difficult is it to create a foundation? Because that's well, something I think is a new area. It's not a new well, area, but it's a new Australia, I can't really comment on, yeah. but I can comment here. Well, I can talk, talk about Australia. If you're interested in doing something in Australia, have a look at what's already there mm. and try and partner up with someone. Yeah. Because there's thousands of organisations, mm. some of which are good, but need different kinds of expertise. If you can find something that's existing, well. that's in your field, and that you can find people who are open, because mm. that's important... That would definitely be the way to go. It saves you time. You've already got some traction, mm-hmm. and they've already going to have some sort of an infrastructure to help you with. Yeah, you can come into that, develop a trust model between you, then get your friends involved. You can move quite quickly. Mm. Here, um, same thing. There's already quite a lot of organisations going. Mm. Check who's about. Try and partner up. Yeah, I'm a huge believer in partnership. Because well, you've got quite a few partnering with yes, you Yes, I yeah, do. Yeah. And, and you can have Australians partnering with you too at the foundation here. Okay. Well, my board are all Australian. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not to, I don't really partner up with any NGOs in Australia, mm. but I do here. Like, yeah. We do education, 100%. That's our job. Mm-hmm. Bali Kids, who... Oh, they're not up there, but they should no, be. We'll, we'll get they're some pictures. Bali, Bali Kids... <laughs> Um, do health. They're fantastic. Yeah. And so they do thousands of children in the communities for health. Yeah. They look after our children's health really, really well, mm. which means I'm not distracted with malnutrition issues, TB issues. Yeah, of course. You can um, get on with the education. Skin disease issues, mm. HIV. 
cancer, or you know, when you start doing a thousand kids, all of these things pop up. Mm-hmm. And if you don't have the expertise to deal with that stuff, it's incredibly time consuming mm-hmm. and just saps your energy. I was going to say, you, you, you probably feel a bit doing. defeated yeah. because you start to think, oh my so, god, I can't make a dent in this problem. Yet. Exactly. Yeah. So you don't need to do that. You've got in, a, in Bali, we've got Bali Kids, which is a health organization. Mm-hmm. They do a brilliant job of what they do. Uh, we've got a very, they're well audited, they tick all the boxes, they've got tax deduction, all the things that one needs. Mm-hmm. Um, and so how we work with them is that through one of our board members, Angela Young, who is the managing director of Strawman Australia, a big international dental company. Mm-hmm. Strawman want to do things to do with um, dental health. Yeah. So... Angela's partnered them up with Bali Kids, ah, yeah, so they yeah. they help set up a big dental facility at Bali Kids. Yeah. Through Bali Children Foundation, we pay for the dentist and the dental nurse. Mm-hmm. And I think this year, Strawman are working to develop a mobile van situation, and that's in process at the moment. Then, of course, the rest request will come, we'll need another dentist and we'll need yeah. another dental nurse, and then that'll come back to us. So my board and sponsors are perfectly happy to provide the sort of capital that's needed to do that Yeah. if that means that we don't have to worry about our health or our dental care for our children. And you can get on with so educating So that them. is a great partnership yeah. and yeah. one I'm very happy So there are, with. yeah, there's quite a few steps. I mean, there's one thing to educate the kids, yeah. but actually there are all these other things that can impede, impede their yeah, ability. Yeah, or you've got children with disabilities, yeah. so that's yeah. YPAC, mm. you know. Um, there's... So there are other organisations doing good work mm-hmm. here and it depends, you know, as an individual or yeah. as a corporate presence, what you're interested in, yeah. um, then you, you, you need to research and find out who's doing stuff in that area. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I'm always happy to answer an email if it's a question of pointing yeah. someone in yeah. the right direction. Do you feel, because I feel, and you know, it might be just a, I don't know, with a, a naivety or a hope on my part, but I just feel, you know, there is the money in the world and there is the resources in order to solve every problem that we have out there. How do you feel about that? Do you think, do I you think, think that's totally true. Yeah, that if we just wake well, up. Well, I mean, it's empirically more, true. Yeah. There's no question. So if we have more people just waking up to what's possible and feeling like, because I think a lot of people think, oh, well, what can I do? By well, myself? I think that's you know? a big issue, and that's mm-hmm. where. Um, if you're leading a project where mining opportunities is really important. Mm. I just wrote an email to my family today um, Mm. about something that came up and reminded me to thank them for something. Mm. My sister is a midwife in Taralbin in Victoria. Mm. And when I was trying to get kids to go to uni, because it was really hard at the beginning to get anyone to imagine going to university, when when they came from a town that... Where a, a, dis- a district <laughs> where with maybe no water, yeah. but a district where it was normal for kids to leave school at grade six. So it's a huge thing to ask them to manage to Being manage a university. Like that, yeah. And like four years ago was our first real intake of uni students. Mm. We had a couple five years ago, but the majority were four years ago. So it's taken a long time to get. You know, yeah. we've been going 14 years. Yeah, yeah. It took 10 years, really, to get the first decent lot of kids to uni. Mm. And I was keen for nursing to be part of it, and I was keen for accounting to be part of it. Oh, yeah, the Because I've got a brother who's an accountant as well. Yeah. So Nellie, my nursing sister, came up, and she talked a lot about nursing when we were on a project mm. visit. And she managed to do it in a way that um, encouraged a couple of girls to get interested so three years ago, we put our first two girls into nursing, mm-hmm. um, into nurses' college in northern um, Bali at yeah. Simaranja. And one of those was funded by my family, Barry mm-hmm. Family Scholarship, and another one was funded by another organisation. Yeah. And then Nellie became friendly with Ratnadi on Facebook. They'd already met. Mm. And because is an adult... I allowed them to communicate separately rather than via the foundation. Yeah. Now, they don't communicate a lot, but enough that Nell has this line of mentoring going back to Ratnadi and her colleague, Katort, yeah. who started in that year. Yeah. So it comes the next year, and I want a couple more to start. Nellie happened to be here for the holidays. We had a big sort of pizza, coke, 
afternoon club meeting. Mm. She talked about nursing. The girls who'd done nursing talked about nursing. The next two confirmed they wanted to do it. Mm. This year, we've got our next two. Yeah. And they're funded by Ishka Shops in Victoria and oh, New South Wales. Yeah. And another friend who's retired from the ethnic game, a guy called John Byrne, who had shops called Ogers in Victoria. So... The important thing is that Nellie's mentoring on Facebook, mm. modest as it is, has been enough to grow a program where we push to get two girls in, mm. to a program where we've got two girls every year. Now, that sustainability is really important because I need partners to work with, partners again, that yeah. word, I need partners to work with on the internship side for these girls. Mm. So at the end of third year, they're going to have an opportunity to do an internship. We're working to get a local um, Western connected hospital to do the internship, and that's BIMC. We're oh, hoping yeah. that BIMC will do the internship, which is in July 2015, for our first two nurses. An important part of this work of developing this is that I have to have something that's ongoing. Because mm. setting up something like this is really a yeah, lot not for of work. A one-off. Yeah. It, they're not going to do it for a one-off. I don't want to do it for a one-off. Yeah. But because we've got two girls now coming through for three years guaranteed, yeah. it's going to be much easier to set up that deal. Yeah. And you know, once we've got to the point of, I feel quite confident we'll have two more next year and this will be an ongoing thing. So we don't need to ask BMC to do anything that's a waste of time. Yeah, we're, so all we need to ask them to do is to do two a year and in that time frame which suits them anyway. Yeah. And we've got something to build on. So that the continuous nature of programs is really important. Mm. And even though I've got quite a big team at at BCF, it's not yeah. just me, I've got the two staff members you've met upstairs, yeah. Robin and Ag- Agnes, and we've got a you know, full team in the, in the villages. We've got an office in the villages similar to this yeah. with, out of Bunja, which is near Lavina. Mm-hmm. And we're running our programs out of there. So we have paid staff and we have yeah. voluntary staff. Robin, you met upstairs as a She's full-time voluntary. volunteer. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you, besides that organisational structure, you have to have mates and people to help. You've got to have your supporters. Mm. And Nelly, what Nell's done is really, really important. Because that's gotten this into the sustainability. Yes, yeah. so I was thing. sending a letter out to the family to thank Nell. Yeah. And actually to try and get my nieces and nephews interested yeah. because they've all got great degrees and yeah. really flash jobs. And I want to start partnering them up with well, that's students. I mean, that's brilliant now because I was yeah. going to say my next question was obviously going to be, you know, for people watching... Mm. How can they, if they want to connect with you, connect with the foundation, get involved? I mean, there's obviously the financial end, but there's the mentoring end as well. So, yes. So if somebody wants to sponsor a child or donate to the foundation, first of all, where should they go if they want well, to do that? Um, well, they, they can go to our website. Yeah. And I think at the end of this program, you're going to put up the website address. Yes, it should be there right now. email address. Yes. Okay, yeah. so... Um, they've got those two points of contact with us. Yeah. So that is the first point of view. And um, tax-deductible donations can be done either via email, via emailing us or going directly onto the website. Uh, sponsorships are for a primary child is 200 a year, yeah. junior high 300, senior high 400, mm-hmm. university 1500. Mm-hmm. Um, so very doable. very doable. Very doable. Mm-hmm. But know. we do encourage our sponsors to consider it before they do it because we hope that relationship will be with the child for their whole education. If the child decides to go to tertiary, there is no expectation the sponsor will take that opportunity on because it's it's more costly. Yeah. They can choose to, some do, some don't. But we really do look to our sponsors to take the child through to to senior high school. Yeah. Yeah. So it is a you know, it's a commitment and it needs to be thought about. Mm. If that feel if that doesn't feel right for yeah. a sponsor then a one off contribution which can be towards an English program or a computer yeah. program or uh, just general uh, setting up the community <laughs> yeah. project work would be, of course, very welcome. So that's another what thing. What about mentors? Well, if somebody's interested in doing this Facebook mentorship. Everyone always asks about volunteers. Mm. Now, volunteering is really tricky for us because we're a long way away. Yeah. Um, you need really need some form of functional Indonesian to work in the communities. Oh, yeah, yeah, the okay. kids have got some English, but mum and dad doesn't have, and it's really difficult if you haven't got functional Indonesian. So volunteering is a bit tricky. 
you're very welcome to come and visit our projects. Mm -hmm. We're open. We have an open village day every month, so mm -hmm. that's very accessible. If you're in Bali, you can come mm -hmm. up and see what we do. But mentoring is much more interesting. Mm. And for mentoring, we would have to know the person. They would have to have police clearance. Yeah. And they would have to have something to offer that we'd vetted and decided mm. fitted our model. So they, you know, somebody could email you if they were interested in yes, potentially doing that. Yes, particularly if they're Victorian. Yeah. Um, where I've got more board members on the ground because we have to be very careful about how we approach this for all sorts of reasons. Yeah. But a mentoring process is definitely an opportunity and, you know, it's not a lot of work, it's a question of staying in contact with a kid on Facebook and it's an adult child, not a child under age, yeah, yeah. so it's a child who's already in university, um, there are certain guidelines that have to be followed, but I'm just discovering how valuable this can be yeah, and so this I hope be a to future. develop a policy towards yeah, this for the right, future. Right. I like that idea. Yeah. yeah, Just as another avenue for people to potentially stay, even if somebody is funding it, but also to stay more connected. Because sometimes yeah. you give money to these things and you think, I don't even know what's happening. Yeah, here. well, sponsors, of course, can send messages, but they're sent via the foundation right, so okay. that they're not... Yeah. So there's no direct interface, which is just the correct protocol. Mm. But... Um, our sponsors also receive letters twice a year from the student, um, their latest school report, yeah. and they know what's going on. They can know what's going on with the child if yeah, they choose yeah. to. If they wish to communicate, and they, they can. can visit you here if anyway. they wish to visit, they can. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Margaret, thank you so much for coming on the show because, you know, I really, this is a real element that I want to introduce to the show is the whole philanthropic thing and, right. and just the giving back. So I really, really appreciate your time yes. on the show. Thank okay. you so much, and thank you for the great work that you're doing here. Thank in you very much. Yeah. I've got one final comment yes, to make. Yes, go ahead. Yes. You, you, you put out the message that uh, it's important to grow your wealth, to mm. grow your dream. Yeah. And I think that is very true, but sometimes the fact that you're doing the dream means you just have to make money yeah. to keep the dream rolling. Yeah. And that can be a powerful incentive as well. So it's not so much you know, greed-based or money-based no, or something no. like that. It's just the empowerment you need if you've got a big dream absolutely involves money, and some of it better be your own. Absolutely, That's you know. I mean, if, yeah, and thank you for just making that comment because mm. I am very passionate about it. I'm trying to change the perception of money in society. Mm. I think after the financial crisis, and, you know, you've got films like The Wolf of Wall Street, and they, they, they paint a very ugly picture of money. And I think if we can change the perception of it and we can channel it in the right way and get everybody dreaming a bit bigger and having bigger visions for the whole world, it's an amazing thing. And then we can do amazing things with it. No doubt. Yeah. Mm. So thank you everyone for watching again for another week. And I'll be bringing a final episode of Feminine Wealth TV to you from Bali next week uh, with my friend Ness, who has a jewellery business here in Bali. And she's flying it. Thank you and see you then.